This Week in Gaming, Nintendo has confirmed that Wii U hardware production has ended. November 18th through the 21st will be an Overwatch free weekend on all platforms, and while we're talking Blizzard, their new senior vice president is Alan Atom, who co-founded the company in 1991 and left in 2004. He's back and better than ever. Skate 3 has received back compatibility on the Xbox One, Master Blaster Zero is in development for the 3DS. The newly formed First Contact Entertainment has announced that they're working on a sci-fi VR FPS titled ROM, Extraction, and we have a video editorial on choice and gaming. This is 1RBC Gaming Weekly. Keep it stellar, Star Seekers. First off, regarding the end of Wii U production, there were rumors last week that Nintendo would be stopping production of its current home console. Nintendo vehemently denied these rumors, but this week, their Japanese site announced that their Wii U hardware would be going out of production. In statements made to North American outlets, Nintendo confirmed that Wii U hardware that's being sent to retailers is it. This is unsurprising. The Wii U wasn't exactly a hot seller, and Nintendo's going to release a new console, the Nintendo NX, excuse me, it's now called the Nintendo Switch, March 2017. So while the Wii U didn't have the best run, it did have some really great games released. Pikmin 3, Splatoon, Super Mario Maker, the list goes on. Chances are it'll be worth picking up a Wii U sometime after the Switch is released, as you'll most likely be able to get a bunch of these great games and the system for cheap. But don't wait for too long. Nintendo products have the funny tendency to retain their value. First party Nintendo games are a more stable currency than gold. An interesting though not entirely surprising accessory for the HTC Vive was unveiled this week. The TPCast. The device went for sale through Vive's Chinese site, and its purpose is to allow players to go completely wireless with their virtual reality headsets. The TPCast, when it's available again, will cost you about $220, which is pretty steep all things considered. The Vive itself is $800. Now, virtual reality, of course, is an expensive enough hobby. To put this in perspective, however, if you want a wireless Vive, it's gonna set you back $1,000. Now, we are still pretty early in the current generation of VR, so you can expect to see cheaper competition coming soon. It's gonna be a necessity if the market is to grow and survive. If you're watching this show, then English is probably your language of choice. That said, perhaps you have a friend who speaks German, French, Spanish, Russian, Turkish, or Farsi? If so, good news. 1979 Revolution will now be available in those languages. In case you've not heard of it, 1979 Revolution is an adventure game set during the great political upheaval that occurred in Iran in the late 70s. You play as a photojournalist armed with your camera and your morality. The game has come under attack from the current government of Iran for, supposedly, poisoning the minds of the youth and young adults. The game has since been banned for sale in that country, though I suspect that's not going to stop its distribution over there. The game has received tremendous critical acclaim, having won the Indicate Grand Jury Prize, and having received plenty of praise from players. 1979 Revolution is currently available for iOS, OS X, and Windows. In game releases this week, Small Radio's Big Televisions was released on the PlayStation 4 and Windows. It's a rather unusual sort of adventure game in which you're exploring virtual worlds within cassette tapes. When the tapes are exposed to magnets, their data becomes corrupted. This is actually an important part of exploring the virtual worlds within the tapes. It's a short puzzler from what I've been hearing, but it's gotten pretty good reception from players and the press. Check it out if you're looking for something weird and sort of nostalgia-inducing for an analog age. Contact with magnetic devices is forbidden. Extended use of the device is not advised. This tape will restart in three, two. Small Radio's Big Televisions, available November 8th on PS4. Still feeling nostalgic? Well, you may want to look into Super Rad Ray Gun, which was released on Steam this week for Mac, Windows, and Linux. Now this is an updated version of the game Rad Ray Gun, which was previously released on the Xbox Live Indie Games platform. 
Now this game draws inspiration from Game Boy platformers and it involves plenty of explosions. It's an action platformer and it's gotten really good reception from the players. So if you're a fan of Mega Man and you're looking for something with lots of levels and no colors, check out Super Rad Rega. Also, the game features music by Phantom NK. So besides some good old platforming action, you're getting some sweet chip tunes. You can't beat that deal. If you're looking for a puzzle platformer, you might want to consider Candle, which was released on Steam this week for Mac, Windows, and Linux. The game boasts a stunningly beautiful art style that makes great use of watercolor. It's like a painting come to life and made playable. Now, in order to solve the puzzles in the game, your left hand is used as a candle. You can use this to fend off enemies and light up the game's world. Now, I have not yet seen any reviews of Candle as the game is quite new, that said, it looks to be well worth checking out. The game has been published by Daedalic, and they do have a pretty good track record when it comes to picking games. If you need less action in your puzzles, Orbit might be right for you. Available now on Steam for Mac and Windows, it's a very simple minimalist puzzler in which your goal is to launch planets into orbits around black holes. There aren't very many reviews from players for the PC version of the game on Steam, but those which are there are largely positive. Orbit is also available on iOS and Android, where it has garnered much critical praise, as well as praise from the players. Now, I've played the Android version of this game, and I must say that I'm quite impressed. Besides being aesthetically impressive, the soundtrack's full of Chopin, which is nice, the mechanics are easy to grasp, but the puzzles themselves can be surprisingly challenging. I can definitely recommend checking out Orbit. If you own a PlayStation VR, you might be excited by this. Crytek's long-awaited Robinson the Journey was released on your platform. In this adventure, you play as Robin, a kid who's stranded on a strange planet inhabited by dinosaurs. He wound up there after his ship, the Esmeralda, made a crash landing. Now he has to find out if anybody else who was on board survived. And of course, he has to stay alive. Thus far, the game's gotten mixed reviews. On the one hand, it is stunningly beautiful, and is definitely one of the best looking games you can pick up for your PSVR. Unfortunately, however, its gameplay has some pretty serious issues. It's an adventure game, and its puzzles are designed in the wrong direction, as it were. That is to say, they're only intuitive to the people who designed them, and not to the people playing them. This is probably the oldest problem with adventure games. They can be frustrating when their puzzles fail to provide the correct clues in order to solve them. It's a pity that the game is held back in this way, as it is really gorgeous. If you're after a sci-fi adventure that looks great and don't mind unintuitive puzzles, it might be worth picking up Robinson the Journey when it goes on sale. Otherwise, however, I can't recommend the game. In crowdfunding news this week, a game called Asylopole caught our attention. It's an adventure game in which you play as a psychiatrist named Adam Murdoch working inside an asylum. I'll let the game's wonderfully bizarre trailer explain things further. Asylopole is currently on Kickstarter and is in development for Windows. Yes! I can play you 205 different tunes, of course! Huh. Very interesting. Hello there. Do you know where... You've just interrupted while I was meditating. And I don't appreciate that. Uh... 
Okay. I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Adam Murdoch, and you must be Mike. I hope I'm not disturbing you. Well, isn't that why I'm here? Because I'm disturbed? That's right. I'm the one doing the talking here. There's not much going on up there anymore. Tell me more about your project. Asylopole is a satirical, old-school adventure game. It takes place in a dystopian future, where it is a daily struggle for the population just to stay sane. Under the huge dome that covers the megalopolis and all its inhabitants, you play the role of Adam Murdoch, a psychiatrist working in an insane asylum, a gigantic building that supports the center of the dome. When treating patients, you are able to access their innermost thoughts and help fight the phobias and other mental problems that exist in a virtual world that is known as Mentalis. You can complete quests, fight villains, message your friends, surf the alternate, increase your stats, play minigames, and eat burgers. Up until now, We've been building a silo pole in our garage, and we need your help to complete and finish up the project. That's why we're on Kickstarter. Be part of our success, and for that, we'll be eternally grateful. Really? You are totally crazy. And this Kickstarter thing, what is it anyway? Some kind of god? In a way, you could say that. In fact, it's watching us right now. This week, Nintendo has released the NES Classic Edition. Now this is a console that comes with 30 NES games built in. This includes Metroid, Final Fantasy, Balloon Fight, Excite Bike, and of course some Zelda and Mario. It's smaller than an original NES, and though it doesn't accept cartridges, you can plug it into your fancy modern television via HDMI. This week, Nintendo held a launch party for the device at their New York store. We've got a few images from the event here. It's interesting to see how Nintendo is banking on nostalgia. The plan is clearly working as the NES Classic sold out of most retailers this week. It's one of Nintendo's fastest sellers, and it's probably a good reminder for them that there's still quite an audience for their older stuff. Does this mean that we get a new, legitimate, Metroid game one day? Maybe. Maybe. Finally, we have a new Mass Effect Andromeda trailer, which was released this week. BioWare's in-development sci-fi ARPG is set to be released early 2017 for PlayStation 4, Xbox One, and Windows. Enjoy this latest trailer. Our dreams of peace were shattered. Welcome back. You're the new Pathfinder. This is incredible. It's acting like a gravity well. I have a bad feeling. We're the aliens. My God.
Well, that's it for this week's game news. For all the greatest game news, be sure to follow at One Will Be Cool on Twitter and Instagram. Be sure to follow me at Jordan underscore Cameron for my own views. And now, without further ado, enjoy the following video editorial on the subject of choice and video games. Walking into the Banner Saga 2, I had a rough idea of what to expect. Hard choices, beautiful music, and lovely hand-drawn art to frame a sad story. I'd played the first game in the series and was certain that I'd remembered it well enough to know what to expect from its sequel. The trouble is, I'd forgotten something important about the first game. My choices didn't always matter, and that made the experience more meaningful. In case you're unfamiliar with it, the Banner Saga is a series of strategy RPGs set in a world heavily inspired by Norse mythology. The game's aesthetic draws quite a bit on old cartoons, complete with rotoscoping. Prince of Persia isn't alone in this aspect. You play as the leader of a caravan that's trying to survive the end of the world as you know it. You're often called upon to make difficult moral decisions that have an impact on the outcome of the game. Your choices, much of the time, do matter. Now, popular gaming wisdom dictates that the measure of a good story-based video game can be decided by how many elements of it can be interacted with. Games are praised for having destructible environments, a lot of little toys to tinker with, and complex, branching storylines. On at least one occasion, a game advertised the AI of its fish swimming out of the way as being something special. It was nothing special. The Banner Saga disregards a lot of these ideas in a way that other games can learn from. Now, this isn't to insult the artists and programmers who go through the trouble of making destructible environments that are fun to blow up, and it's not to disregard the value of a complex and well-written story that most players will never see the end of, and I have nothing against AI fish, even if they're not special. The point isn't to tear down other games, so much as it is to point out why the Banner Saga has done something special. You see, in this world that takes special note of games for having a lot of interactivity and moving parts, critical praise gets heaped upon games with the most complex narrative structures. The stories with the most parts that players can affect, or at least seemingly affect, are the ones that get all the glory. For fans of Telltale's adventure games, such as Wolf Among Us, watching the way that their choices unfold in a game is the most exciting part of playing. At least, that's how it is on their initial playthroughs. Players of these games are sometimes disappointed when they return to play the games over again, and discover that while the game's stories are entertaining, they're not really that affected by the choices they've made. Much of the time in a game, What's been designed to look like a narrative tree with branches full of choices is really just a big circle of a story. You may start at the top of the circle and draw a line to its bottom, and along the way you may choose your own path, but ultimately, you wind up at the bottom. I've dabbled a bit in creating interactive fiction and feel it is worth mentioning that creating narrative circles, multiple choices that lead to the same place, can be a useful tool when writing for an interactive medium specifically when it's necessary to take players to a particular place in a game story. The choice the player makes to get to that place may be irrelevant to the story itself, but to the player, it feels like an important decision that's been made. Additionally, if every choice in a game led to a different story branch, the cost of producing said game would be absolutely astronomical, hence why you can die in a multitude of gruesome ways in a choose-your-own-adventure book. The books would be incredibly thick if every choice led to a fully fleshed outcome. That's not to say that expanding on every choice can't be done. Stories, the path of destinies, is a platformer that's broken up with a choose-your-own-adventure style game in between levels. Essentially, you need to make decisions about how you'll interact with characters, choose your locations, and use quest items as you advance through the game. Stories is designed to be played through multiple times, as it's not possible to win the game on one's first playthrough. You need to use the knowledge of your previous playthroughs, knowledge about the world and characters and their motivations, in order to win the game. Every decision you make has an influence on the game's outcome. Plenty of hard work was put into making sure that this game story could go anywhere. Now this dedication has paid off for stories. The game has garnered plenty of critical praise and has a lot of adoring fans. Having played it myself, I must say that I'm a fan, and loved uncovering new story paths. What stories or Path of Destinies did was daring, 
but it made total sense as per traditional video game storytelling wisdom. The Banner Saga, however, goes the other way. By presenting the player with choices that are ultimately irrelevant, it breaks away from the idea that a choice needs to have quantifiable consequence to a game's narrative, and embraces the idea that a choice can be made for the sake of role-playing. In other words, in the Banner Saga you make decisions because they're important to you, not because there's some tangible in-game benefits. This represents something more than interactivity. It's immersion. It's role-play. But it gets better. Much of the time, the Banner Saga hardly differentiates irrelevant choices from major ones. I've made seemingly little choices that ultimately cost the lives of characters I come to care about. Not all the small choices are meaningless. In the first game, I chose to spare the life of a baby dredge. A dredge, by the way, is one of the monsters in the game. Now, I don't know what's to come of this decision. It was touched upon briefly in the second game, when a character made mention of it while talking about my caravan. I'd love to see the eventual consequences of that decision, even if they are tragic. Having choices that don't matter in the long run gives a lot more impact to the obviously important decisions. Take Boulder, for instance. He's a Varl, one of the last of a race of giants. In the Banner Saga 2, Boulder leads a caravan of his own, the Ravens. These battle-hardened mercenaries are a very different group than Rook and Let's Caravan. The Ravens seem somewhat invisible in the game. You don't really see your Ravens, except for a few that join you in the game's combat mode. When playing as Bulwark, however, your actions will impact their morale. If you don't behave as Bulwark would ordinarily, that is to say, if you're not brutish, mean, and bellicose, then your men are going to lose respect for you. Acts of charity will cause Volka, the closest thing you have to a friend, question your actions and wonder if you've gone soft. It's the little things like this that pull players into the Banner Saga. I was so used to taking the clearly righteous route in RPGs. To play as Bulwark, who leans quite heavily on the dark side of grey morality, and to be rewarded so often for unkindness, really changed my mind on what constitutes role-playing in a game. The Bulwark I played was, in many ways, my Bulwark. So while I was playing as him, a little piece of me had to become that berserker. Yet, a little piece of Bulwark had to become me, if that makes any sense. I could feel some part of myself just getting into character, as though I was enjoying a traditional tabletop RPG. So he wasn't a faceless avatar, a bland character for my adventure-seeking wish fulfillment, but he wasn't an inaccessible actor in an otherwise interactive story. In some ways, this lies in the face of the argument that a game can't be used to tell a story the way that an artist wants it to be told. While we are largely past the argument that video games aren't art, a tired accusation often leveled at games that tell stories is that their stories are somehow less relevant because no two players will experience them in the same way. We've all seen the same Casablanca, but are any two playthroughs of L.A. Noir identical? Yet, when a game immerses a player so fully in a character that the player is thinking through the lens of the character as best he or she can, can it still be said that the player's involvement is a hindrance to artistic vision? It would seem that putting characters in players' hearts is the ultimate extension of narrative vision, a true mark of storytelling prowess. And that is where the Banner Saga succeeds. Story elements and dialogue choices don't have to contribute directly to pushing forward a game's main plot. Dialogue choices can serve to reinforce a player's connection with her character when written with the character voice in mind. The recent Fallout 4 could have benefited from this bit of narrative design. Players quite rightly complained that too many dialogue options in the game were too vague. Besides making the meaning of dialogue options a bit clearer, perhaps if Fallout 4 spent a little more time encouraging players to develop their characters beyond their appearance, they'd be a bit more invested in the game story. While I think the Banner Saga should be celebrated for its storytelling style, I don't think that every game should try and emulate it. For a game with a larger scale, many decisions that you make in the Banner Saga for the sake of role-playing have the potential to weigh down a more action-packed experience like that of The Elder Scrolls V Skyrim. That said, other games could stand to learn from the storytelling of the Banner Saga. What do you think?
Do other games stand to learn from the Banner Saga in terms of storytelling? Let us know what you think on Twitter at One Rule Be Cool, and be sure to follow us for more cool video gaming editorials and examination. Be sure to follow me at Jordan underscore Cameron for my own thoughts. If you feel that this program brought some value to your life, you can back us on Patreon at patreon.com slash 1RBC.